Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining us, everybody. My name is Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs, broadcasting you from my uh, home in Clapham today, rather than our offices in Westminster. Uh, thanks for joining us for this live broadcast on the 2021 Suez Crisis, or is it indeed a crisis? If you are joining us on YouTube, um, pl please, please make sure that you uh, put your questions in the chat. I'll try to get to as many of those as we possibly can. Um, and um, we're going to run through this enormous topic, not just on Suez, but the fragility of global free trade in, in about um, 30 minutes or so. So that's now out of the way. Let me introduce our two great guests for this debate who are going to take a, a different approach, but there might be a, something of a Venn diagram of agreement between them. Um, Johan Norberg is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, a prolific writer who focuses on globalizations, entrepreneurship and individual liberty, and he's always an optimistic guest on the IA London YouTube channel. Good afternoon, Johan. How are you doing? Good afternoon. I'm feeling optimistic. Good. That's good to know. If you start feeling pessimistic, Johan, just think how pessimistic I'll start feeling. You're always on the optimistic end of the spectrum. And William Clouston is the leader of the Social Democratic Party, a role he was elected to in 2018, which I'm told means he's held the leadership longer than the leaders of any of the uh, main UK-wide parties in Parliament. Uh, William, thanks very much for joining us again on the IEA London YouTube channel. How are you? Great to be back. Thank you. Yeah, good, thanks. So uh, the idea for this broadcast actually came from an article on the 1828 uh, website, uh, a blog that we uh, now help run from the IEA in which William was a contributor about whether or not the blockage of the Suez Canal caused by the container ship ever given running aground shows some of the dangers and shortcomings of globalization. So let me just sort of throw a few facts and numbers in your direction. The ship is 400 meters long. It was carrying 18,300 containers just below its 20,000 uh, container capacity, finally released by 14 tugboats. Uh, the Suez Canal accounts for 12% of global trade, 1 million barrels of oil, 8% of liquefied natural gas pass through the canal daily. Uh, the trade across the, channel, uh, across the canal accounts for 2% of Egyptian GDP, or did so um, pandemic. According to Lloyds of London, um, the incident held up an estimated $9.6 billion of trade each day or $400 million an hour, about 3.3 million tonnes of cargo being held up every hour, or about $6.7 million a minute. And although rerouting options were available, and some took them, that can add eight days to the journey. So is this a sign that globalisation is a little too fragile? William, what do you think the lessons of this incident are? Or is it just one of those things that caught the headlines, but we've we, we've got over it already and things will snap back to normal? Nothing to see here, nothing to worry about. Uh, obviously, it's just a, a, a particular incident, I think, um, you know, illustrating the, the fragility of a particular pinch point um, in, in global maritime supply. Um, and, you know, we're not surprised that the um, blockage was sorted in a few days. And yeah, you had a few hundred um, major vessels backed up, but I think things will get back to normal. I think the it is more, it's a wider point really about uh, globalization that we can link to it. Um, just the, 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 the fact that um, over the, the last 30 or 40 years, uh, you know, we've seen economic policy, global economic policy dominated by econ liberal thinking, which has basically uh, been indifferent to what is made where and by whom. And our criticism is that that's, that's overreached somewhat. And we'd argue for uh, what we describe as a, a slightly softer globalism, one in which nation states can make uh, a series of economic, social and economic bargains themselves. And, and uh, just before I come to Johan, what would you sort of, could you give us an indication, William, of what you see kind of included in that? You know, are, are there particular sectors or products or services where you think globalisation has gone too far? Could you list these? You know, these, these are the bits where they've got to be at least, I don't know, 50% domestically produced or 100% domestically produced. What do you have in mind and how do you have that dividing line? Well, I think we, I think you know, a country like Britain needs to, I mean, you know, industrial manufacturing is down to about 10 or 11 percent of GDP. And, and, and that's problematic anyway. So there are sectors which we look at. Certainly, uh, you know, steel is, is in the news now. I would regard that as a 
strategically important sector which can't be allowed to be completely removed. And I suppose it's, it is at risk of that if, if we're completely indifferent to it. So there are many things, I mean, many other sectors, you know, um, you, you know, you could think of, um, you know, manufacturing uh, trains and rolling stock, a lot of things we've lost, which weren't in the interests of those producing it, basically. I think the, the, the basic policy error that's been made over the last 30, 40 years is that Western governments in particular, particularly Anglo governments like, uh, you know, the United States and ourselves, have really um, prioritised the interests of, of consumers over producers. Uh, and we've forgotten that uh, ultimately consumers are, are producers, you know, producers are consumers. Johan, you're one of the leading advocates across the globe for liberalisation and globalisation and a sort of indifference about what comes from where and the magic of the market to, to deliver things. Has globalisation gone too far? Or do you, would you actually like to see it go further? And if it hasn't gone too far... How does somebody of a liberal market mindset sort of explain away these sort of glitches or problems or difficulties? You know, nothing to see here, move on. Uh, what's your take on that? Globalization too far and too fragile or not far enough? Well, not far enough, but we should be grateful for the fact that we have it at least to this extent. Yes, there are glitches and problems in, in several uh, places that has an effect on us, but please remember that most historical glitches and problems and most disasters nowadays from floods to war to recessions to epidemics are local in nature. So it means that when problem strikes, if you have the, your whole supply chain back home, everything falls apart immediately. We learned that during the uh, pandemic, I think, how much we benefited from being able to buy the goods we need from other places. I think this Suez crisis, we're, the, the interesting thing is that it's been so fundamentally undramatic. It's not a Suez crisis, it's more like a Suez glitch, even though 12% of global trade is passing through this canal. Uh, to us, to most of us, it's just a slight price increase on everything so that all of us think about substitutes, other goods can get it from somewhere else so that shipping companies are thinking about other routes. Uh, obviously very dramatic for those involved in, on the ship, on the tugboats and so on, but not for us. And that's the way it should be. That is the magic of the market, that everybody is working hard to use their local knowledge to adapt to something new. And so in a way, I, I'd see this as a, a great success, just like the pandemic. Please remember that originally we just hoarded everything, all the pasta and toilet paper that we can find because we thought that the world was falling apart. But that was really a dog that didn't bark because all those companies, all those shippers, they constantly work hard to tweak their supply chains, to find new suppliers, to work around all those glitches so that they filled up and stocked the shelves again. Uh, and that's globalization for you. Well, Johan, let me press you on this. Do you think there's, uh, do you compromise at all with William's position here? Is there anything where you might say, oh, no, I, this has some strategic concern, some security concern, some health concern. Uh, I mean, let me give you an example on the, the vaccine rollout, where the, the United Kingdom is doing enormously better than the European Union. But we, we seem to have this sort of permanent thing, you know, will the EU block the supplies coming over to the UK? Uh, and then that's only one step away from the, oh, my God, in future, shouldn't we make sure that, you know, important medicines are all manufactured in the UK? Because we can't be at the mercy of Ursula van der Leyen on whether or not we're going to get a shipment through um, to the port of Dover. Uh, another example would be um, Huawei, a Chinese company, this is more on security concerns, should they be the people, you know, uh, helping us expand our broadband, or do we consider that to be a security threat? Johan, do you have anything in, in the box of things where, oh, actually, there might, there could well be market failure here, or something so sensitive, or, or so important to security or health, that we, we need to kind of have a, a national insurance plan about it, a national production of it? Yeah. Well, I would agree when it comes to whether there are inc incredibly sensitive parts of, for example, our digital infrastructure, where we don't want a hostile power to be involved. And I don't know whether that's Huawei, but I'd be open to um, intelligence services looking hard and deep and long at it. And, and if that's the case, if it's a backdoor for the Chinese Communist Party, Fine, that's a reason to ban it. But apart from that, I find it very difficult to find any exceptions to the free trade rule. And the reason is that trade 
dependence on other countries, that is the way to resilience. That is the way to maximize our ability to get things from other places. And obviously there is a problem when someone picks a fight, when Ursula von der Leyen suddenly says that no vaccines are, are going there. But is that a reason to respond in kind what would that kind of world look like? Well, we're all dependent on ingredients, on chemicals, on um, bags, on uh, tools for the vaccine from every other country. It's a reason for everybody to count to 10 and take a step back. And I hope write better uh, international um, trade agreements that says that, no, you can't do that with any kind of phony excuse of, of public health because it's bad for, for all of us, rather than trying to have an excess supply of everything. Because this is the problem. We don't know what the next crisis is going to look like. Now we think that we all need to have a, a flourishing industry of uh, sort of one pound face masks. <laughs> uh, but the next crisis will not be a health crisis. Uh, the next one could be a cyber attack. It could be a war. It could be a flood. And then we need something else. We had forest fires in Sweden last summer. And we all thought that everybody had to be in firefighting. <laughs> we need to buy water bombers. This time around, no, everybody has to be in nurse. So it means we need flexibility rather than constant oversupply of everything we needed the last time around. William, just before we came on air, we, we, we touched on the sort of Brexit issue as well. Mm. Uh, I mean, you could make a case, couldn't you, from a market liberal position, that you get all of these sort of scare stories, whether it was Brexit or the pandemic, you know, my God, everybody's got to go down the shops, buy all your pasta now, because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, why there was a run on toilet rolls is still amuses me. That is, that is a product that has some pretty obvious substitutes. And I would have thought that it would have been food and water that people would run for. But actually, the market system delivered extraordinarily well uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, the the sort of Brexit crises that you know I'm like, you know will medicines make it in time to the pharmacy? What other shortages will there be? I'm not yeah. saying there haven't been any glitches, but you know overall enormously smoother than anyone foreseen. So we had the sort of yeah. doomsayers, but actually it's all turned out pretty nicely, hasn't it? Yeah, no, I thought it would. I mean, I, I spent 10 years res uh, irresponsible buying industrial products for a company on Tyneside, and 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 you know I had no doubt that. Uh, you know, post Brexit, we'd uh, the supply lines would 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 be maintained. I think that's just an example of, of you know politi political opponents um, mobilizing uh, arguments against you, and also you know the press and the media in general is a sort of anxiety machine, which it which it is. Um, and interestingly, actually, temporary blockages of flows or even delays. You know, you can delay a trade flow by several days, but as long as as it's contiguous. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it might add to cost, but I had no um, doubt at all that the supply lines would be maintained. I'd just like to go back just to challenge uh, Johan a little bit. I think the I think the globalization has created a situation in which we, in most markets, we have fewer but larger producers. And I would contest that a situation where you, you get that in an extreme situation say some semiconductors, you know, where Taiwan is, is a dominant player and you've got one or two other dominant players. It's not a, it's not a sustainable position. It's certainly, I wouldn't argue, I don't think you can argue that, it, that the global supply of product is made safer or more robust to shocks. I think it's probably made more, more fragile if it's centralized in that way. And I think another thing which, you know, all econ liberals should, should be aware of is that the tendency for corporations to, you know, again, this fewer but larger, more powerful uh, tendency, it does have a, 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 an impact on, on markets themselves and whether, you know, the state is regulating the market properly uh, or whether you've got a sort of market failure because of market power. And you only have to look at big tech for that. But, I mean, there's a lot in this question. I think I, I, when we argue for some trade friction and for a, a, more, a greater domestic focus, uh, it, certainly on manufacturing, I think you're partly looking at a political question. Again, I think a lot of the thinking, econ, uh, liberal thinking post-war, has been rather utopian. Uh, it's, it's, obviously, it's got a strong theoretical basis, but um, I'd ask, yes, you can, you can allow the world to turn in the way it's turned, with, with China dominating in so many industrial uh, um, areas, but it becomes a political problem when you have say in the United States or here, you have uh, post-industrial cities where 
many, many people have lost the industrial wage, which was the foundation of the family. And you start to get social effects, which again, it, it's led to what people describe as a sort of populist backlash, but you've got a situation where politically it has to be addressed. And I don't think governments, I think you've, I think you've, you've, you've got a situation now, certainly in Britain and possibly the States where, you know, Hayek uh, type uh, ultra uh, free trade purist thinking is past its high watermark. And I think politically, um, politicians have to address these questions. And I would argue that the way we'd, we should sensibly address it in the UK is, is through some trade friction, reshoring, import, import substitution, because I think the cities in the north, certainly uh, above the wash and the Midlands, uh, could do with some more uh, industrial jobs. And I think if you only, I think it could be achieved if we had a set of uh, political elites that actually believed in that programme. Johan, quite a bit to unpick there, but let me put William's challenge to you. Firstly, on diversity of supply, uh, William mentioned semiconductors from Taiwan, but you could, you could easily hypothesize, you know, something that's utterly crucial where there's only one uh, company, or maybe you're not so worried about the company, maybe you're more worried about the jurisdiction because you're worried about a veto coming from the prime minister of that country or the president of the European Commission or whatever. Well, and I suppose it's very similar to the kind of monopoly uh, criticism of free markets. You know, what should free market liberals think of monopolies um, arising? Uh, what, what's your take on that, Johan? And, and then I'll put to you Williams, the, the second part of his thing. Do we actually need, does a globalised supply chain need a certain level of diversity? And if so, does the state need to impose that level of diversity rather than being wholly reliant on a particular company or a specific jurisdiction for something that might be fundamental? Well, yes, I think we have to ask ourselves this question. I recently realized that apparently um, most of the world's supplies of, uh, of Europe supplies of condoms come from one single company in Malaysia. And obviously that could be a problem. Um, on the other hand, the traditional problem is local monopolies. The fact that uh, if we don't have fierce competition from other places or potential competition from other places, someone will rip us off back home. We need that kind of competition to make sure that they constantly upgrade and, uh, and change uh, what they're doing. Um, there are instances when something is so incredibly important for us for security, safety reasons, that the question has to be asked. And then we should look into those supply chains. Take steel, for example, for the military. That We need that in a potential military conflict and we would have to, um, and that's actually a government task to, to look into that. But in that case, I want to hear that from the military, not from the steel manufacturer or from the protectionist, because they're always going to say that we need that kind of, of local production back home. And, you know, when, when Donald Trump imposed his steel tariffs and, and thinking that Canada and, and Britain was a threat to, to national security, the Defense Department in the U.S. said that, no, I think that the U.S. military needs around 3% of the domestic manufacturing of steel, which means that even with the present day manufacturing, with all that competition, they had much, much more than they, they ever needed. But if the Defense Department said something like that, that no, this is a serious threat to, to our supplies during war, that would be something to look into. But don't trust the manufacturers, because they'll always say that they are the most important uh, of God's gifts to mankind. And let me um, take William's second point, um, put it to you again, Johan, before I come back to William with your repast. This is the sort of the, the industrial wastelands argument uh, that, uh, that the sort of, you know, the disciples of Hayek say, well, you know, I'm sorry that uh, suddenly some other part of the world has found a better way to mine coal or produce energy. But, you know, I won't worry about it too much. Why don't you just become computer programmers instead? And, and, and in fact, what sort of happens is you just get these sort of wastelands. I mean, the city of Detroit in, in the United States, for example, disaster area really now economically. Uh, do you think that, uh, Johan, that the kind of history book shows that those kind of market instincts, oh, don't worry, it's just another redeployment of labour, somehow doesn't work? And if it hasn't worked because uh, we haven't replaced, you know, coal mining in the Rhonda Valley with computer programming in the Rhonda Valley, why hasn't it worked? Yeah. No, I think it's, it's not just 
anything goes and we don't care about what happens to people there, uh, we should empathize and, and work hard to think about things like retraining and, and even relocation to places where, where jobs are uh, more easily available. But I, I would challenge this romantic idea of manufacturing because it's not that we're not producing stuff anymore. In, in the whole of Europe, we're producing much more manufactured goods than we did in the 1980s, almost twice as much. It's just that we don't need as many workers to do it because a factory nowadays is not made up of hundreds and thousands of people, but a few guys with a computer. So that tells you that it's not really trade. It, it was technological change that began this process. And if you look at wasteland like Detroit, they lost more jobs between 1950 and 1980 than they did after 1980. So it wasn't Mexico. It wasn't China. It was the fact that they kept producing in a less competitive fashion and they lost manufacturing and jobs to Southern American states that were more open, that weren't so heavily unionized, so every single item didn't cost 15% more uh, as it did in, in Detroit. So it tells us something about local institutions rather than anything else. But the thing with industrialization, we can produce more with fewer people, and that is a good thing on the whole. That's the, the process of every industrialized country. Japan peaked its uh, population in, in manufacturing, its workforce in the 1960s, Singapore in the 1970s, Korea in the 1980s, because they climbed the value chain. They left more things to automation and inputs bought from other places, and then they moved on to more of design, more of marketing, more of distribution, and more of face-to-face -face meeting rather than uh, standing in, in the factory. And that's why those countries have done that, have done better than the ones who keep the old jobs. Mm -hmm. China has lots of jobs, but look at an iPhone. How much do they get? Well, the last numbers I saw was on a $650 iPhone, they get some $8 out of it. Of, of the, the uh, because they don't add the value. That happens in, mostly in the US, but also where you buy it in, in London or what have you. So China makes 1.3%, even though it looks good with all those factories. William, let me come back to you, therefore, on Johan's sort of uh, 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 challenges there. Why the fetishization of manufacturing? And, you know, if, okay, I know we've had a rough year, but if we're confident that the economy over the long term will grow, manufacturing mm. could potentially continually fall as a proportion of our GDP, but the total amount of stuff that we actually produce uh, goes up. We're just becoming more and more efficient at making steel or, or cars or whatever, fewer workers uh, involved in it. You particularly mentioned that you thought manufacturing was on, you know, too low a side here. Well, mm. Why? I mean, how, how do we work out what the, what the correct proportion of GDP in the manufacturing sector should be? Well, uh, probably the trade deficit, the UK's trade deficit would be a, a little um, hint at that. Um, I don't, I think it does matter. I think it does matter. I think, you know, um, the shock of the pandemic actually has exposed to some extent the fragility of service-based economies. Uh, you can't uh, base a whole economy in, uh, you know, on rubbing people's feet. Uh, manufacturing does matter. And I, nor do I think it's romantic. Um, I think, if anything, the, the uh, liberal econ case over the last 30, 40 years is, is, is rather romantic and utopian. I think uh, global free trade as an idea, political idea, is highly utopian. Um, it, and we, we, we're never going to get that anyway. I mean, non-tariff barriers are... Quite, a, quite astonishing. I mean, you know, the, the, certainly in, in the corporate, uh, the, the links between corporate and, uh, and government elites in states like South Korea and Japan are so tight that uh, effectively we operate an entirely different system. I mean, our large corporations are run for, largely for the uh, benefit of the executives who run them. And I think they've become sort of deracinated and detached from the uh, states and the localities that they operate in. I, I, I think that's a problem. They need to find that, rediscover that actually. But I, I go back to the point about strategic um, uh, vulnerability. Uh, a, a society where you gutted your manufacturing to the extent that in a crisis that you have to go uh, begging for essential supplies, I can tell you as a politician, uh, the next generation of politicians in the West are not going to put up with that because their publics won't put up with it and uh, their reactions uh, going forward are gonna be quite different. 
Um, I think, you know, I, I think a lot of a, what we're seeing is a lot of things coming to a head uh, at once. You know, you've got a series of financial crises, crises. you've got uh, over indebtedness um, in, in the government sector and the household sector. And the West is, needs to rethink. And I think an indifference to things like persistent trade deficits, um, which is quite a modern thing. I mean, you know, you know, historically, 60s and 70s, politicians talked about it openly. It was an issue. Now it seems to be sort of passed off as something that doesn't matter. I just make one final point on the strategic point. The utopian basis for a lot of liberal free trade uh, purism is I think a product of the 70 years, it's a product of Pax Americana, it's a product of post-war peace. You've had 70 years of, of broad, broadly a peaceful situation in the West and we've become indifferent to, 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 to our vulnerability. And I think uh, you only have to pick up a newspaper in Australia, uh, have a look at that because the idea that your, that your trade with your major trading partner won't be weaponized uh, is is completely flaky going forward. I mean, just just speak to Australian politicians about it. Um, if you have a vulnerability, if you have an over reliance on a particular sector, your state is very vulnerable. And I I think the idea that we are in a completely peaceable situation where these things won't be weaponized and we're not going to have uh, you know uh, blocks that have a, simply a different outlook about how to, to to run their affairs going forward, I think is 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 unlikely. So I think. A lot of chickens are coming home to roost and uh, not before time. But William, do you think that that, and I want to bring in Johan on this resilience point, do you think that the potential problem there, and I'll give a caricature, is that, uh, as Johan was thinking, there's a danger that our politicians all always fight the last war. So the mm. lesson they'll draw is, ah, oh, we need to be able to get our hands on protective medical equipment much more quickly than we did in, in 2020, or syringes or face masks or whatever. But mm. actually, the next crisis will be something completely different in which so, face masks are, are used. So isn't, isn't it a question of rather than trying to predict or build or stockpile yeah. or working out what you might need, simply having the tools to get what you might need that you can't predict and you just need to pull the right levers at the time? No, I agree. I mean, that's very, very, I mean, historically, that's quite likely to happen. And, and also at a point of agreement with Johan, I agree. I mean, you, you, if you over, if you overdo protectionism, you're into price gouging and inefficiency, and you're going to go nowhere. So you've got to get it right. But I'm, I, our case is basically that uh, we've had a, a slight overreach, particularly in the, in the deindustrialized West, which needs to be dealt with politically. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, for me, I would look at uh, cyber vulnerability. Again, I, I argued a few years ago, and this is part of the thing that's wrapped up in the indifference, sort of liberal indifference of these things, where, you know, until a couple of years ago, you know, a couple of years ago, major, the, the leaders of our most successful political party were completely indifferent to uh, Huawei, uh, you know, take, basically taking the lead in our 5G network. And that, that to me was absurd. And that's, that's um, it's naive, basically. I mean, it's, that's just, li you know, liberal view, uh, uh, vastly overextended and they're not thinking they're not they're not understanding the things that previous politicians of previous generations would have under, understood like national resilience they don't get that uh johan what's your take on that i mean you you've touched on huawei earlier you said you know without going into the details that's the sort of thing that you think that, that the state could perhaps should rightly look at rather than just say it goes to the highest bidder who whoever they might be but can you pick up william's point on trade deficits as well should I be concerned about the UK trade deficit? It's big. If I should be concerned about it, I should probably be pretty heavily concerned about it. Or should I not be concerned about it at all? Um, William suggests that this incredibly relaxed view of trade deficit is a relatively modern phenomenon. Do you remain relaxed, Johan? And if so, can you make me feel a bit more relaxed? Well, my question is, um, William is not relaxed about Britain's trade deficit. But I understand that you, you're from Northumberland, right? So what about the trade deficit with Cumbria or Durham? Are you, are you worried about that? Do you even measure the trade deficit between those places? I don't think you do. And I don't think you're worried if you buy too much food from there or too much uh, clothes from, from um, Durham, because if you do it, it's because you are doing something else. You are producing something in return for that. And then it doesn't really matter if you have some sort of arbitrary calculation on whom you end up in a trade deficit with. 
I'm sure that um, Mark has a great um, trade surplus with IEA, but probably a trade deficit with the bookstore. Uh, the, the one problem is if you just consume too much and you don't work. Uh, but that's a question about indebtedness and I'd say monetary policy rather than, rather than trade policy. So I, I wouldn't worry about that. The one thing that looks awful, sounds awful, obviously, is if we go to an begging other countries and even dictatorships for important supplies when we need them. I don't want to end up in that position. But when the unexpected strikes, everybody has to turn to whomever can help out. So did China. We think that China has an excess supply of everything. They don't. If there's a 20-fold increase in the demand for, for face masks, they were out of it. And in the first two months, China had to import 2 billion face masks from other places. And that's one of the good things, because even a global crisis doesn't strike everybody at the same time. So other countries could help China out. And then when China got out of the pandemic, they could help us out by, by sending uh, us masks. I don't find that particularly humiliating. That's what we have to do. The worry is that countries begin to block their borders, ban exports, and that of, that's often what happened in, in Europe during this time. That's a, that's a terrible thing. France started to confiscate uh, personal protective equipment that was just crossing their border going towards uh, Spain and Italy. That's bad. The conclusion is not to behave more like the French, but, but to keep, try to keep those borders open. And what helped us through it? was that we could buy single-use medical gowns from, from other places. The imports from outside of Europe increased by 1,700% during that time. That's a sign of strength, I think, and, and strength and the benefits of, of globalization. And then obviously also having flexibility back home. Uh, the number of European companies that produce face masks increased from 12 to 500 in a matter of two months. And that's the flexibility, I think, that we get if we can get the other stuff that we can't produce from other places. William, let me come back to you. And I want to return to a point that Johan was making earlier, that, that, that the danger of the producer interest. I thought he made this interesting point about steel. Uh, you know, the, the, the standard argument made about it being a strategic industry is we, we, we can't know if we'll suddenly need to make a large number of munitions. And if you did, you wouldn't necessarily suddenly want to be reliant on a Chinese supply. But his other point was that we, we tend to hear these arguments from, you know, the steel workers, the trade union and the owner of the steel factory. Shouldn't we say we're not listening to you at all? We want to hear it from the, you know, the, the, the generals or, the, you know, the people who need to say, look, you know, we need such an, an amount of steel every year in normal circumstances. We need to make sure that we could access this if we suddenly need to uh, get in, involved into a major conflict. Listen to them, the buyers of the steel, not the producers of the steel. Do you think there's a danger that we're always listening to the producers, not the kind of end users? Oh, yeah, I, I, I take that point. I think you've got to be careful of that. Um, and you've got to have sufficient competition, otherwise it won't work. But you, I, I, I think... I mean, there's also a moral aspect to this. I think, you know, one of the things that we've been indifferent, we've been encouraged to be indifferent about is the, the um, conditions under which some of uh, this stuff is produced by our competitors or the people that supply uh, Walmart um, and uh, Asda and so on now. Uh, we're, we're encouraged to not really think about it at all. Um, an, old, uh, an old fashioned trade unionist from the 70s would, would make the point that if you're, if you're you know, if you're, shoe factory in, in the Midlands in, in England has to uh, compete with a, a, another one elsewhere. Can it possibly be uh, right if, if the uh, workers elsewhere are being paid abominably uh, where the environmental standards might not be up to scratch and so on? I mean, some of the, some of the factory conditions uh, approximate to slave labor. Can I just take, uh, I'd like to come back uh, to Jan on, on, the, on, the, on the trade deficit point. It's a tremendously important point uh, in the long run, not in the short term. I, I think in the short term, it doesn't matter that much, but you've got to remember that imports, in, your imports are paid only in three ways. You can pay for them by what you produce now, uh, what you produced in the past, uh, and, or you can issue paper promises effectively. Those are the three ways in which you can pay for them. And if you, if you, if you um, constantly issue debt, uh, to pay for them, or you constantly sell what you've made in the past. And, and again, conservative politicians, at, our own conservative politicians, have been very good at passing that element of the trade, well, the flip side of the, of the trade deficit 
offers FDI as if it's something good. It's not not all FDI is good. A lot of FDI is is basically to pay uh, to make to make trade balance because you're 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 needing to sell uh, what you've already made, and that a lot of that's just just capital going out. So I think. Uh, it is important we think about these things. And if we don't think about them, you're basically asking your society to get poorer or slip more, you know, over the, over the years. Yeah, and let me come to you for your final words. Do respond to that point, And I'll pick you up on your Cumbria, Northumberland example. Might it not be a problem if the people in Northumberland seem incapable of selling anything to Cumbria and are buying everything from Cumbria? You might actually think, okay, we don't measure that particularly, but you, you might actually think, well, Northumberland doesn't look like much of a sustainable part of the country to live in. They can probably get away with this uh, this year, next year, and maybe the year after. But at some point, if they're not doing anything that the Cumbrians want to buy from them, seemingly, uh, you've got a problem. Do you think it is a short-term problem? Or, I mean, over the long run, you, you go bust, right? I mean, because you're, you are buying more stuff than you can afford. Yeah. Yes, and obviously that's a problem, going bust, whether it happens slowly or, or quickly. Um, but I wouldn't say that that's related to trade at all. You can go bust by buying local stuff uh, as well, and you can quit working um, whether you like it or not. It's the, when it comes to the trade deficits, that's really about macroeconomic factors, such as how much do you save, um, how much foreign investment makes it into the country. So countries with high savings rates, like Germany and China, they run trade surpluses. And countries that don't, that have a tradition of budget deficits and lots of indebtedness, like the US, has trade deficits, no matter what trade policies they adhere to. There's no particular relationship to, to trade. So, and, and yes, I happen to think that great debts, that's a problem. And that's something that has to be dealt with. And I think that we've had a long era of policies and monetary policies that have encouraged excess uh, indebtedness. And that's a problem by itself, no matter what kind of trade policy you have. And Johan, let me, let me, I, I want to hear from each of you. Johan, I'll start with you, then I will give the very final word to William. What what do you think, Johan, we've learned from either the Suez glitch, as I think you rightly call it, it's not, it's, it is not. It is hyperbole to call it a, a crisis, it was a glitch and it's been resolved, or the pandemic, but recent events, uh, what, what do you think we've learned from them that we could ensure that we become more resilient in future? What are the things we need to change in our institutions or our public policy to make sure, even if we can't predict the next crisis or or glitch that we're able to deal with the next crisis or glitch when it emerges? What would you like to see change to build that resilience? Or do you think it's at the optimal amount? Well, I think that what we've learned from both the pandemic, uh, specifically the pandemic, but also the Suez glitch, is that um, trade is important. Globalization is great and is creating enormous value for us all the time, making it possible for us to specialize in the areas where we can produce the most, because we notice it when it's gone. The moment the world shut down and the world closed its borders for only a couple of weeks during the pandemic, well, the result was a global depression, almost 100 million people thrown into extreme poverty. And that tells you something about the benefits that it's contrib contributing to all the time. And then we, yes, I think we've learned again that it's not useful being dependent completely on uh, input that are inputs that arrive just on time that can uh, disappear, whether it be in China or the other, the block over here, which would be even worse because disasters, again, often strikes locally. It used to be when we had bad weather in Sweden, we starved because we couldn't get food from any other place when it's when there's a crop failure. But that kind of so we need diversification of inputs and of trade, not concentration, I would say. How do we get that? Well, that's what I don't know. And politicians don't know and cannot comprehend because these are millions of decisions that are taking place every minute. And they can only be done by the businesses, entrepreneurs, the workers, the shippers who have that local knowledge and know about what they can do, what the alternatives are, what they can stop doing without creating disaster somewhere. So it's only through their experimentation rather than, than command and control from, from the government. And we've seen that. We, we've seen already how they're, they're working very hard with lots of um, uh, contingency plans on where to get supplies, often trying to buy from several places, even in normal calm times, 
in case, just in case there's a hurricane or a Suez glitch somewhere. So leave it to the experts, those who are who have all that knowledge rather than to politicians. And then, William, finally to you in a nutshell, what's your or the Social Democratic Party's sort of key plan for improving resilience that when the next glitch or crisis hits, we're better able to deal with it, whatever that glitch or crisis might be? I think the the, the lessons of all of the uh, of, of crises generally are, are, are brutal. Um, uh, unfortunately, people, politicians and elites often don't, don't learn them. Um, this one is the same, actually, which is the, the key point, the key thing to, to understand uh, is the importance of the nation state. Because what you find is, particularly in crises, um, all these sort of fairly uh, flaky ideas, utopian ideas about, uh, you know, global free trade or, or, you know, or reciprocity in the European Union, they just, they just fall apart in a crisis. You saw that in, in the financial crisis, the euro crisis, migrant crisis. And again, you've seen it in this um, viral pandemic. In these crises, um, solidarity uh, and sharing is convened at a national level. And if you understand that and you, you, you get your policy right in terms of nation states, then your nation state might be resilient. And I think the performance of states like Britain and Israel, actually in Singapore to some extent, have shown, uh, shown the way. So that's the basic lesson. But it's a lesson, Mark, that the social Democrats already, already understood. William and Johan, thank you very much for joining us and helping navigate our way through the Suez glitch and numerous other crises. Always a pleasure to uh, have you with us. Thank you very much for joining us and for such a, a, an engaged and in, important and informed uh, discussion. Thanks to all of you watching us on YouTube. Uh, please hit the thumbs up and the, the, the like thumbs up. Uh, if you're not already a subscriber to the channel, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Just a couple of quick advertisements. The IA's in conversation series of events online continues next Wednesday at 1 p.m. when I'll be speaking to Northern Ireland First Minister Arlene Foster. Uh, my colleague Christopher Snowden will be sitting down with journalist and author Matthew Saeed for an in conversation on Tuesday the 13th of April at 6 p.m. And if you're looking for something to do on your Easter bank holiday, uh, I think you can now go to the park, but of course you can't go to a pub or a restaurant or the cinema. So we're providing some entertainment for you. On Easter Monday, we're hosting a panel with the Institute for Prosperity on levelling up. The panel includes Labour councillor Brendan Chilton, former Labour MP and chair of the Institute for Prosperity, Caroline Flint, and businessman John Mills. Register for that webinar by visiting the events page on the IA website, ia.org.uk. And I'll also be back next Wednesday at 6 p.m. with my regular Live with Littlewood show. So tune in for that for our usual mix of free market commentary and analysts uh, and analysis from a wide range of guests. Thanks again to Johan and William. Been a pleasure having you. Thanks all, to all of you for watching. Have a great day. Over and out.